Welcome to another edition of Inside Medicine. I'm your host, Doug Geinzer, and we are here in the studio today with Dr. Samir Kamar. Uh, he is the founder of MedLion, the inventor and founder of MedWand, an expert in concierge medicine, and an uh, all-around great guy. And uh, for those of you that are new to Inside Medicine, we broadcast live here in the studio every single Friday at 10 o'clock a.m., if you have questions that you would like to ask our guest along the way, please go ahead and connect with us at vegasvideonetwork.com slash chat, and you will be able to uh, slash live. I am sorry. Uh, so again, vegasvideonetwork.com slash live. You will be able to ask those questions, and we'll get answers from our guest. On Inside Medicine each week, we bring innovators, leaders, and inventors right here in the Las Vegas area that are doing good things to improve the quality of health here in Southern Nevada, something that is true to us for the mission of Las Vegas Heals. At the same time, we're looking for feedback. If you have any feedback to provide us on the show or you'd like to be a guest on the show, go ahead and email us at editor at lasvegasheals.org. Dr. Kamar, welcome to the studio. Thank you, Doug. So go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. You've got such an intriguing background. We've had a couple lunches together, and each and every time I learn something new, and I go, wow, this guy's got a lot going on, and you're bringing so much to Las Vegas. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, uh, wow, that's a loaded question for me. I'll <laughs> just start with my background. I'm the son of a United Nations diplomat. I grew up all around the world. Uh, before I turned 18, I'd been to about 100 countries, spoke several languages, and after having lived everywhere and uh, done pretty much everything that a teenager would want to do. We settled in Pebble Beach a few years ago, right after residency to open up the first concierge medicine practice in that area. And I became the house doctor for Pebble Beach Resorts nice. uh, during that time. And then I started two companies right after and made a move to Las Vegas about three and a half years ago. So where'd you go to med school? So I went to medical school at an international medical school called okay. Ross University School of Medicine. Mm -hmm. I did my rotations in England at University of Leeds, followed up with my training at Johns Hopkins Hospitals in Baltimore, uh -huh. and then finished up everything with family medicine at UPenn in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is Amish country. So did you get to treat the Amish? I did. That was a lot of fun. Very cool. So it's I grew up in Pennsylvania, uh, spent a lot of time around the Amish. Uh, my wife is of German descent, fresh off the boat, and every time we go back there, she demands that we get out into the foothills and meet the Amish so she could speak Sprechen Sie Deutsch. Uh, so it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. So tell us a little bit about that experience. I, I'm intrigued by that. It was fantastic. Um, Lancaster General Hospital is the largest hospital in Lancaster County. Mm -hmm. uh, and you'll know I've been to Lancaster and lived there. If I say Lancaster, not Lancaster. Uh, fantastic experience. The hospital system, which is run from an academic standpoint by UPenn, is considered one of the best family medicine programs in the country. I'm proud to say they consistently get ranked in the top 10. Uh, in fact, I believe it was one of the first family medicine programs in the country. Wow. So you moved from Amish country to Monterey, California. I did. How did that happen and what drove that uh, decision? Healthcare, uh, in a nutshell, I was dissatisfied with what we were learning in residency when it came to not clinical training, but the way training was to be applied in practice. So when I questioned my superiors in training about why we had to see patients every 10 minutes, mm -hmm. the answer I typically got was, well, this is the way it works in the real world. And I didn't like that. So I started challenging the system while still in training to see if I could find a better way to practice. You were that guy. I was that that <laughs> guy, the fly in the ointment, right? That wasn't dead yet. And uh, buzzing around, looking for a better way to practice. And I found concierge medicine mm -hmm. that was very new in 2002 at that time. And test market in different areas around the country. Believe it or not, at that time in 2002, concierge medicine was not existent in Chicago, in Houston. Wow. MDVIP had just started in Miami. Uh -huh. And so after realizing that to do this on my own, I would have to do my own thing. We settled on Pebble Beach. It was a nice place to live. The demographics were perfect. My wife's from California. Uh -huh. And literally six months before residency, we started advertising in Pebble Beach. Wow. And uh, when I graduated, I had about a dozen patients waiting for me to make house calls, and we, we moved across the country. So what was it like making house calls in Pebble Beach? What did that look like? And then on top of that, are you able to tell us any of the patients that you were able to see without violating HIPAA? <laughs> sure. So the experience was fantastic. And concierge medicine typically doesn't involve house calls all the time, but because of the predominantly geriatric population that existed on the peninsula mm -hmm. and people who are just very busy executives who are retired or semi-retired, they really like the house calls 
practice part of it. So that, in fact, became my biggest service. Uh, made house calls all over the peninsula. It was the first concierge practice in Monterey. It started in 2005, and I really liked it a lot. I, you really get to learn a lot about patients when you go and visit them in their own home, home environment, sure. in their office environment. Uh, that led to a gig with Pebble Beach itself. Pebble Beach Resorts called me two months after I touched down and said, we like the way you practice, and we want you to build your new practice around us. Would you mind being our house doctor? So I became the official house doctor for Pebble Beach Resorts, the youngest in their history, apparently. And I did that for about seven years. And I did take care of all sorts of celebrities and movie stars and heads of state. Names? Names? Names. I can't go into specifics <laughs> for obvious reasons, but uh, band members of Def Leppard, band yeah. members for Journey. Nice. Uh, some movie stars from Hollywood, heads of state, senators, yeah. lots of senators. And uh, it was it was great. You really Any learned a lot. presidents? Uh, yes, ex-presidents, but I can't get into who uh, and why, of course, but uh, just a great experience all around. That's so cool. So you also did a stunt with uh, Mazda Raceway, Laguna Seca. Where did that come about, and what was that experience? Like? Sure. So I learned to drive in Italy, uh-huh. which is not a great place to learn how to drive, although it comes in <laughs> handy when you're driving in Las Vegas. Uh, the speed of driving is very quick, uh-huh. uh, and so I, I've always liked nice cars, fast cars, and Mazda Raceway Laguna Seca is considered one of the best racetracks in the world, and they needed a they needed medical help. So I went and applied, and I got accepted as the assistant medical director, um, and I was there for in that capacity for almost seven years. It was it was fantastic. We set up the trauma team, the trauma bay. There is yeah. uh, an on-site hospital uh, that is used for emergencies during big races. Uh, supplied by the Salinas Valley Memorial Hospital System. And mm-hmm. I managed those trauma bays with a team of very good physicians and neurosurgeons. I was the only family doctor on the team. And uh, just a fantastic experience all the way around. It's pretty cool. So you mentioned earlier that you speak six languages. What are those? And Sure. So um, my father is from India. Uh-huh. Originally, he was born in India. And so he speaks Hindi fluently, mm-hmm. which is the Indian language. My mom is originally from Pakistan. Uh-huh. She speaks Punjabi. She's from the Punjab province that straddles both India and Pakistan. Uh-huh. So I speak Punjabi. I started French in fourth grade. Mr. Walker was my fourth grade French teacher, and I continued French all the way through every single grade until I graduated from high school. And then to get easy A's in college, I took French in college as well. So I speak French. Uh, Italian was uh, done when my parents settled in Italy 20 years ago when my dad worked for the UN division called the FAO. They're based in Rome. Mm -hmm. Uh, We had a house there for a long time. And Italian is very similar to French in terms of grammar. It's a romantic language. So I picked that up very quickly. It's a very cool language to learn, uh, very easy after you've learned French. And Spanish is basically America's second language. And you have to learn how to speak some Spanish if you're in medical practice. So that plus a little bit of English I think it's six. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm still learning English. I, I used to speak a couple of more languages uh, when we lived in Indonesia for a while. I went to the same primary school that uh, President Obama went to uh-huh. in Jakarta at the international school there. But I spoke Bahasa for a while, which is spoken in Malaysia, wow. in Indonesia, and Singapore in some places. I've forgotten that because there's really no one to speak with. Uh, yeah. So I've tried to maintain my other languages as much as possible. Well-rounded. Do you use that when you're treating patients periodically? Very seldomly. Um, I will say in a place like Las Vegas, it comes in handy sometimes because there's lots of tourists. It came in handy at Pebble Beach when there were lots of tourists. Uh, But no, I don't use it so much unless I travel, and I do miss it. Uh, So I'm starting to try to practice to keep that skill if I can. So you moved from Monterey then to Las Vegas, Nevada. I did. Why? I was in the New York Times. I was profiled for a new model of health care called direct primary care. Mm -hmm. And... Vicki Robinson, who was at that time head of benefits at uh, the city of Las Vegas, invited me to present that model. So we did. My team came here about four and a half years ago, and we presented. And they said to me, Dr. Kamar, we could really use this healthcare model here in Las Vegas. We have a lot of part-timers. We have a lot of uninsured who could really benefit from this high-quality primary care model that you've conceived. Why not here in Las Vegas? And I thought about that. And, you know, Monterey is a beautiful place, probably one of the most beautiful places on earth. And, But it's a very small town. It's a village, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's in between big cities. It's easy to be a big fish in a small pond. Sure. But I didn't want to be a big fish in a small pond. I wanted to make this model big everywhere. And okay. So Las Vegas seemed like the perfect place to start that. Uh, this place did, I think, need a lot of help in trying to resurrect health care and, and bring innovation here to, to the city. So after some research... I told the old office, I said, guess what, guys, you're moving to Las Vegas in three months, and we did. Wow. So for those that 
are watching that don't know what primary direct primary care is, what is that and how does it differ from concierge medicine? Because they're not one and the same. Sure. So let's talk about three things. Let's talk about primary care. Mm -hmm. Then we'll switch over to concierge medicine and then I'll go to direct primary care. Primary care is basically, it's 75% of most people's healthcare needs. It's your flu shots. It's your physicals. It's where you go for your physicals, your your, your sinus infections, your pneumonias, uh, your diabetes, your hypertension, your cholesterol, your medication refills. It's pretty much all the frequency, you know, the, the high frequency visits that you might need in healthcare. Your family doctors, uh, your general internists, they're all primary care physicians. And that is, is primary care. Specialties are, of course, separate. Concierge medicine was started in the late 1990s. Um, it's theorized it started up in Seattle in the 1990s when wealthier patients said, look, doctor, you're seeing patients every seven minutes. How about we pay you a membership fee every month? Mm-hmm. Might be several hundred, might be several thousand, but you have to promise to just be there for us because we're tired of this type of medicine where you just see you know, us for every 10 minutes. So it was started then. Uh, in fact, MD Squared is known to be the entity in Seattle that started this first uh, so that then spread, and there have been many companies since. MD VIP is one of them that have scaled across the country very nicely. Concierge medicine, typically, you will have an access fee of a couple of hundred bucks a month that you pay to your doctor every mm-hmm. month. And for that, you get their cell phone number, you get to get house calls, you get to see them the same day or the next day. Uh, but on top of that, most concierge practices require you to have insurance as well for the medical portion. Sure. So the access fee is separate, and the insurance part is separate. Basically, you have two premiums. And it appeals to a very different demographic, a very um, well-to-do demographic, if you will. That's what I did at Pebble Beach. That's what I did in my concierge practice uh, in Monterey. To me, that's great, but it only takes care of a very small portion of the population. I wanted to do something for everyone. And so I actually helped create something called direct primary care. And what direct primary care is, the definition of direct primary care, Doug, is the direct and direct primary care is the payment. Uh, It's directly from the consumers to the physician entities. So it's the consumerism of healthcare at its utmost. It absolutely is. And it started uh, in Monterey. Uh, We did it because in in around 2008, 2009, my wife, who practiced a regular practice, saw a sharp decline in her patient visits. Mm -hmm. We decided to start a practice where we took our concierge medicine sort of model, and we scale down the fees to apply to everyone. Yep. Employees who had lost their jobs, farm workers in Salinas who had nowhere to go but the ER. And we wanted to cut those costs down for them because we knew already from primary care that 75% of primary care is is what they need. So uh, 75% of healthcare is what they need through primary care. So we charged a small membership fee, and we were to, able to take care of them. So in summary, primary care is 75% of healthcare needs, all the frequent care that you'll need most of the time. Concierge medicine is when you add an access fee along with the insurance to to get access to that kind of care. Direct primary care, you pay one small membership fee, typically less than $100 a month, and that gives you both access and primary care coverage. The same day, next day appointments, telemedicine, uh, it's a much higher level of primary care than what is insurance-centric today. So for the doctor that is getting into direct primary care, what? How many patients do they see? Do they convert their entire practice? Tell us about from the physician perspective. What does that look like? Certainly. So there are many different types of direct primary care practices. Uh, we call them DPC practices now. Mm-hmm. And some of these practices are pure direct primary care practices where they just don't want to bill insurance. There's no claims. There's so there's no, no coding. coding. There's no coding. Coding doesn't That's exist huge. in a direct primary care practice because we don't rely on insurance to pay us. I'll we rely the, on our consumers to pay us. I'll bet the doctors get excited about no coding. Absolutely. <laughs> we, we didn't have a single insurance class in medical school. Sure. We wanted to learn medical training. And so when we graduate, we learn that it's all insurance-based. We always joke and say, you know, physician, it's the only job in the world where you perform the services, and then after you negotiate what you're going to get paid. <laughs> That's and right. Not after, and then when you're done negotiating, then you have to fight to get paid what you already negotiated for, for services that you didn't know what you're going to get paid in the very beginning. It's, it has a lot of flaws, the current model. And uh, 
we believe, and we're actually practicing this, and it's working, that the direct primary care model works a lot better because you've really cut out the middleman. Yep. Think of it as the Tesla of healthcare. In direct primary care, uh, well, let's talk about Tesla for a second. Tesla became big because they stopped going to dealerships. They sold their cars directly to consumers. Mm -hmm. And they catered to the market, which was the consumer. The consumer could decide what they wanted and how they wanted it. And they didn't have to go to anybody else. They went straight to the person who was providing the service or the Makes product sense. in this case. Direct primary care is exactly the same. The consumers decide what they want. And instead of having to go through a middleman, which in this case is insurance and primary care, they end up going to primary care doctors. Insurance, health insurance is not in the business of healthcare. Mm -hmm. Health insurance is in the business of insurance. Sure. And a lot of people forget that. We are now born into a society in, in our great country where we actually expect insurance to cover all healthcare, and it shouldn't be the case. Insurance is defined as risk management for rare and expensive events. That's it. Yeah, yeah. But we rely on it for a $4 aspirin, and we shouldn't have to. Uh, we don't have to. And so, well, the argument then is, well, doctor, we have to use insurance for everything because even primary care is so expensive where we go most often. Try going to an urgent care center where you just have to get treated for a sinus infection and it's 200 bucks. Why not make primary care, which is, again, 75% of health care, why not make that affordable? And that's what we do in direct primary care. So you're the chairman of DPC United. Tell us a little bit more about that group. And I think you all were involved with uh, some language that appeared in the Affordable Care Act. Sure. So DPC United is a new trade organization for direct primary care. It's the first mm -hmm. medical organization for direct primary care. It's very new. Its purpose is to educate doctors, uh, employers, and consumers as to what direct primary care is, take away the confusion from its um, constant confusion with concierge medicine to just generate awareness about this yep. new healthcare model. Uh, I personally was involved with the ACA amendment that went into play, which was basically putting direct primary care uh, into the Affordable Care Act. Uh, in fact, Senator Harry Reid helped us with that. And it was I was not alone. We had some other pioneers in the direct primary care movement do this with us. But basically it states that if you combine direct primary care medical homes with catastrophic wraparound insurance, you can even compete on health insurance exchanges. Uh, what that did for us is actually gave a lot of comfort to our consumers and our employers who tried to engage in the direct primary care model. And they want to because it helps them save a ton of money uh, in, in health care costs, but they want to know that they're also in compliance with new ACA laws. And, and that's that's what yeah. we did uh, with the ACA. So you're the founder of Medline, and Medline is the largest or one of the largest direct primary care organizations in the United States. What is that model? What does that look like? Why did you choose to bring that to Las Vegas? And what makes it make sense? So d direct primary care, we discussed a little bit. Uh, Medline, we are the largest direct primary care organization in terms of physician numbers. We have about 350 doctors who work with us who are contracted with us in mm -hmm. 25 states. Wow. Uh, that's expected to multiply by a factor of 10. Um, there are some locations there where, in, where all the oranges is. Of course, you'll see a lot of orange here in Las Vegas, but we're starting to grow very quickly. And the reason we're growing quickly is we're more of a carrier now. Mm -hmm. We are a primary care benefits carrier. Interesting. And so what we can do is we can go into any medical office. In fact, we're talking to some big hospital systems right now and ask them to accept Medline patients for Medline primary care, Medline direct primary care. Sure. And so, you know, if you're a doctor, say, Doug, and you take Medicare and you take Blue Cross and you take United and HPN and, and Aetna, you can also now see Medline patients. Interesting. And we pay our physicians very well. In fact, we're probably one of the highest reimbursing carriers in, in this state. Mm -hmm. And physicians will take us on. In fact, we're growing our base quite a bit here in Las Vegas now. Uh, but we are all over the place. But that's how we work. We sell our employer benefits combined with catastrophic plans, many different types, mm -hmm. put them together with Medline, have the employer save up to 30%, sometimes more. It's huge. A huge on healthcare costs, especially yeah. in this day and age. And we sell that through insurance brokerages around the country. Is Las Vegas your biggest market right now? Las Vegas is one of our big markets. Yeah. We are big in Phoenix, uh -huh. where we have about a 20,000 patient capacity right nice. now. We're filling nice. up. Uh, the same numbers are true in Jacksonville, Florida, uh -huh. and uh, those are our main areas of focus right now. I think we're about to sign on a very large 1,000 physician group in Southern California very soon, and that's going to end up being a big lightning rod for us as well. But uh, it's it's going to grow everywhere because doctors are tired of the daily grind. Yep. 
especially in primary care, and patients are tired of the daily grind, and employers are tired of this constant year after year of increasing premiums. So we, we actually cater to many, many parties. Talk to us about the employers that you're engaging with, and you don't need to disclose names, or if you want to, feel free to, but what does that average employer look like? How many employees? Why do they see, what do they see in the benefit of direct primary care? Certainly. So in, let's take Las Vegas, which we know very well. Um, we started out taking care of those industries where they had a lot of low-wage earners because those employers find it very difficult to maintain compliance with some of the ACA laws that say, for instance, you can't charge more than 9.5% of the gross income of that that employee. Um, because if you do, you get penalized. So you have to limit the cost. And it's very hard to limit the cost in an area where insurance is so expensive. So who takes the brunt of it? The poor employer. So you put our model into play and imagine us as a big wedge right into the middle of that plan that takes away 30 to 50% in many cases, the healthcare costs. So we started going after landscapers, after restaurants, after nursing homes, after security agencies, and we got a ton of them. Uh, Once that started, we started getting a little bit more sophisticated, and now we have special high-deductible healthcare plans that our broker partners help us create that are paired with Medline, again, to save them money. Uh, Then we have self-insured plans that we put into place with Medline, again, with our insurance partners. So... It's interesting. It's um, We cater now to small businesses, medium-sized businesses, and even large self-insured businesses. And uh, we're seeing that grow all across the country as the familiarity with the direct primary care as a viable and legitimate model starts to grow. Uh, we, ex- we expect to see a tremendous growth over the next uh, few years. That's amazing. So I want to jump into another topic, another one of your businesses. Uh, I want to spend some time talking about MedWand. You're an inventor, which is not very common for physicians. And MedWand is getting a lot of recognition. I've seen uh, news coming out of multiple different countries. Uh, You won an award up at Health 2.0. Tell us a little bit about MedWand, and then I want to hear about your experience with Health Health 2.0. But tell us about the MedWand. Sure. So the MedWand, um, and that's that's our prototype design up there. Uh, We were called by Google in 2014 here in Las Vegas. And Google said, Uh, Dr. Kamar, you run the largest direct primary care outfit in Nevada. Would you mind doing a pilot with us for a HIPAA-compliant telemedicine platform called Helpouts? Sure. So we did, and they called me back six months later. They said, you haven't been using it as much. What's wrong? And my answer was, you know, we do a lot of telemedicine at MedLion. A lot. In fact, 30% of our consultations are telemedicine, which a lot of employers love. But I can't examine my patients. Good doctors like examining their patients if they can help it. Sure. If you're walking past my office and you say, Dr. Q, I think I've got some trouble with breathing. I think I may have some pneumonia. I'm not sure. If I was a good doctor, I'd say, you know, why don't you just come on in? Let me listen to your lungs. Let me get your temperature, get your pulse ox, because I have data now from which to make a good clinical decision. But telemedicine today is not like that. Telemedicine has become complacent in its definition Mm -hmm. in being okay with HIPAA compliant video chat. Video chat is nothing new. It's been around since the 1980s. And in my opinion, it's not new technology at all. Just because we put a filter of HIPAA compliance on it and put a doctor or a nurse on the other end, we call it telemedicine. There's nothing medical about it. So I asked Google, I said, look, you make self-driving cars. You put satellites in space. Isn't there a way I could examine someone over the internet? And they said, not really. And that was the the, uh, spark. So I got together a bunch of engineers, uh, some of the best in the world, from Red Digital Cinema in Hollywood, sure. from Panasonic, from Mazimo, and I said, guys, here's the project. I want to make something that's about the size of a computer mouse that Doug may have on his other side with his computer, and no matter where he is in the world, I want to be able to examine him. And not just look at him, I want to be able to listen to his lungs, listen to his heart, look into his ears, nose, throat, get some vitals, maybe even an EKG, but something that's very easy to use. Oh, and by the way, it's got only cost a couple hundred bucks made here in the U.S. And so they made it, and uh, the rest is history. So let's go to Health 2.0. Sure. I've heard a lot of my friends and colleagues that have either attended. I've had a few that were fortunate enough to be out, out on stage. You were one of the winners. We were. So we, <laughs> we were. We were the winner of the launch event. We competed against nine other startups. And I examined a patient live uh, from Silicon Valley, all the way here in Las Vegas. Uh, I presented in front of 6,000 people. Wow. 2,000 were in the audience. The rest were watching online live. 
And within three and a half minutes, I had to examine a patient using our prototype uh, in a city 500 miles away, which I did. So I want to, yeah, I want to run and let's roll okay. a little bit of video and sure. uh, talk to us a little bit about this video and what's going on. So this is a live shot from the screen. Um, we have here Allison, who was our patient. She's actually sitting in the Las Vegas Palms Hotel, uh, sick. And I'm asking her, I'm directing her to use the Medwan in the way we, we have her. And she's looking into her mouth there so I can look at her tonsils. Um, let's see, what she, what does she do next? Uh, I wanted to look at her eye because she had an eye infection. And the resolution's not as great here, but um, in the prototype, uh, it's the way it is. The final version is all high definition, but we were looking at her skin. We were basically displaying some of the uses of Medwand. Uh, and then I think we go a little bit further here, and I wanted uh, her temperature, and so I believe she did have a temperature then. Uh, there's a temperature gauge at the bottom there, which is our app. This is what the doctor sees on, on the doctor's end. Um, and I'm looking at her nose there, and I got a few laughs because we didn't see a nosebleed, <laughs> but we got something else, which was fine. And uh, she did a great job uh, for us, but it exemplified how, let's see here. Yep, we have pulse ox coming here in real time. This is all live while uh, I was examining. She was in Las Vegas. I was in Silicon Valley. So you could do this pretty much anywhere. A patient could be anywhere in the world. I was in England. I was in London in, um, just a few months after, a few weeks after this, examining a patient in Texas. That's awesome. And so, yeah, there's her heart rate. She was a little nervous that day, and her pulse ox was great. But we were able to get a pretty decent exam, much more than just telemedicine video. Um, and that's the purpose of the med one, is to be able to examine patients remotely from anywhere in the world. So this device, it plugs into a computer, plugs into a personal device. It does. It plugs into a laptop, tablet, desktop. Uh, the new version that we're creating right now in our lab in Orange County is actually going to be wireless. Very good. It helps people in nursing homes get exams because you don't have to go in and out of the, the bed rails uh, sure. and so forth. But uh, the goal here, think of this as the telephone of medical exams. And talk to us about all of the um, ancillary devices that connect to it because uh, you could connect everything from a thermometer to... Uh, so there we go. We've got a great image. So tell us about these yeah, devices. So the, the device in the middle is the Medwan. It's our new design. It's a bit more ergonomically friendly, and we had to create some more volume to make it wireless. But you're, you've combined, basically, several diagnostic devices into one device, uh, something that has not been done before. We're talking about an ophthalmoscope, an otoscope, a dermatoscope, all that rolled into one. The camera was made by the same folks who made the red four-digital K uh, sam cinema camera in Hollywood. Sure. So they made the camera for this all autofocus and all that uh, stethoscope that we designed in-house. We can actually design the stethoscope to actually listen to fetal heart sounds in addition to your lungs wow. and your heart and your carotids. It's got pulse ox. It's got core temperature, distal temperature. We have a 3-lead EKG in there as well. So you put your finger on top and you place it, or I ask you to place it during the examination, and I can get a good 3-lead EKG to at least see if you're having a heart event. Um, and then we have other vitals that are not mentioned on here. We have respiratory rate uh, as well and heart rate as well. So... A lot of different things that can be used to examine you from a distance anywhere you are. This is amazing. And this touches on a lot of the things that Las Vegas Heels is addressing. We're going to be taking uh, a deep approach into telemedicine. Uh, and really, you know, I think we've got an expert in Las Vegas on so many different areas. We are grateful. We're thankful. Uh, we're blessed to have you here in Las Vegas, innovating, bringing a lot of global recognition to Las Vegas. It kind of fits our plan for developing Las Vegas to become the health and wellness tourism destination of the world. And uh, unfortunately, our show is coming to an end, uh, but I think we barely touched on some of the items that I wanted to touch on. I'd love to invite you back to the show and have you come back on. Uh, but in the meantime, well, you could catch us on Las Vegas um, on Inside Medicine every Friday at 10 o'clock. And hopefully we'll catch you next Friday at 10 in the morning. Uh, in the meantime, Dr. Kamar, uh, if folks want to get in touch with you, how do they go ahead and do that? Sure. So you're welcome to visit our websites, medlion.com or medwand.com. Um, but our toll-free number is 855-211-3223. Dr. Kamar, thank you for joining us here on Inside Medicine. Those in the audience, please feel free to join us every Friday at 10 a.m., and you can catch us on your favorite social media channels. Thank you, and you all make it a great day today.